Institute, which came with its challenges as well as its gifts. 
Uh, I am grateful to have interacted with the building blocks of rehabilitation science uh, and also to contribute to that program, uh, teaching my, my colleagues and my cohort about cultural safety and uh, uh, the impacts of colonization on Indigenous populations and people, as well as sharing our gifts and our resilience. Uh, so I am a healthcare educator. I'm very fortunate to travel and to uh, go to different conferences here. I'm a keynote uh, conference and I'm talking about my practice as uh, an image-based storyteller. Uh, I'm talking about how I take myself to, or uh, to remind myself of my responsibilities as a Dene woman. On the side. <laughs> Uh, I'm an image-based storyteller, and that means that I uh, create images and I situate uh, 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 Indigenous methodologies and Indigenous ethics and Indigenous worldviews, as well as confront Canada's colonial history. And uh, uh, the most important part of my images is illustrating the uh, resilience of our people. I do this with collage and with uh, digital paintings. And uh, these uh, were all words collide. So this is me in the Medical Sciences Building at the uh, University of Toronto. And I have a little video, video here to demonstrate uh, what I experience every day as an Indigenous graduate student. So here I am in my little spacesuit. As you know, the academy is something that's very alien. And I've got the two worldviews, uh, my Indigenous worldview, and there is bioscientific medicine. I use that uh, collage to uh, interact with uh, my experience setting as well as my life experience. My brother died in not a good way last year and I felt that my life had fallen to pieces so I started collaging, uh, cutting things out of magazines and putting them together as a way of uh, piecing my life back together. Leanne Charlie is a marvelous uh, Indigenous academic. She's currently doing her PhD studies at the University of Hawaii at Manila. Uh, she published this work called Indigenous Collage Theory, and it talks about how uh, the complexity of Indigenous identity and her collages lead to the complexities of, of our identity, which is fragment, uh, leaving us with pieces uh, to work with. And I'm just going to read a quote uh, from her article because it is so profound. Indigenous collage invites us to work with the fragmented realities of Indigenous identities, families, communities, cultures, and lands that have been created, sometimes violently, always intentionally, by historical and contemporary colonialism. It offers a space for Indigenous historical realities, present realities, and desired futures to intersect in innovative and unexpected ways. Collage accounts and accommodates the chaotic, contained, and often contradictory life worlds that have been left in the wake of continued settler colonialism by creating a space for Indigenous people to navigate them in creative and empowered ways. Thank you. So for me, collaging is a meeting of two worlds. I'm an adoptee, a 60 scoop survivor, and I started my life with a, uh, a settler family, a white family. And uh, my father, uh, who was a very loving man, my first father, didn't know exactly what I needed, but felt that he could connect with me with animals. So we spent a lot of time reading National Geographic. So when we would travel, he would uh, rifle through National Geographic. So when we went to England, he showed me a, a badger. When we went to Spain, he showed me a horse and told me stories of where the horses came from. Uh, so I'm uh, marrying indigenous stories uh, with memories from my childhood. Uh, I would say both my fathers were connected to wolves, and my daughter is also a wolf. But these collages are a way of uh, addressing indigenous identity in the city. So I think of myself as a, an indigenous person who is uh, living in the city consistently, but also uh, reclaiming my indigenous identity. So this collage here is, uh, I like to think of my father's in the spirit world. Wolves love to travel. They love to travel with their kin. And so they're just going on a fantastic trip in their VW van. So wolves teach us about resilience. Uh, and as I said, uh, you know, both my fathers were connected to wolves. 
Uh, my first father uh, grew up in Holland during the war, very, very bad childhood for him. He became an orphan and he was disconnected from his family. My second father, as a residential school survivor, again, similarly uh, disconnected from his family. Um, because of this, family was very important to both of them and they were very focused on uh, creating a safe space for uh, myself and my siblings. So Wolves teach us about overcoming failure. Uh, when we look at things like National Geographic, we see the wolf uh, portrayed is as a very um, successful hunter, and indeed he is. But what we don't see uh, um, off camera is that he actually fails more than he succeeds, and that is the way of the wilderness. You continue to hunt and you, uh, you succeed sometimes and sometimes you fail. So it was a wonderful lesson on tenacity, of being, uh, of self-acceptance, of accepting the situation that you're in and overcoming failure. Also teaches us how to be good citizens. Wolves live in close quarters with each other and sometimes they have squabbles, but they work things out. And they have this uh, marvelous family. They protect each other and they love each other. And that's the source of their identity. So these are my two fathers. We've got my first father on uh, on the further side from me, and uh, we are in Spain there. And this is my second father, and this was taken a few weeks before he passed away. So I like to uh, create comedic narratives on this uh, world that we're in. So we have a polar bear here. He's in the ER because he's dehydrated. Uh, you know, global warming does tend to dehydrate us. Uh, then we also have. Uh, the bear uh, yeah, getting an MRI again, uh, needing an MRI because of the creation of the contemporary problems that we are in uh, because of global warming. Eagles, uh, eagles are uh, meant to be knowledge keepers. Uh, they fly in the sky and they are close to uh, creator. Um, I like to create feminine narratives around my collages. So I have the uh, corporate eagle here who doesn't fall victim to patriarchy. She's wearing um, a suit without a top, very, very confident. Uh, she is living her best life and uh, able to uh, run the world from her uh, place of being a knowledge keeper. Uh, I resemble more uh, the eagle on uh, this, this kind. Uh, here I am. I'm, I travel. I'm a frequent flyer. I'm flying around the world to conferences and universities trying to gain my knowledge trying to earn my way in the world as a, as a confident leader. I uh, use deer a lot. The deer are very, very close to my heart. Um, deer is the most generous of the animal, giving us flesh for sustenance, uh, their height uh, for warmth, bones for tools and hooves and antlers for ceremony. And I think about the wonderful relationships that I have with women in my life, women like uh, uh, Leah Walker or Cass Dirksen, also the elders that I have in my life, the curators and the librarians that have generously shared their time to give me warmth and to nourish my soul. Uh, and this is what I think of when I, when I look at these, these dear, these women. Caribou is something that is very dear to my heart. It's many people, we have relationships with caribou. And again, I like to uh, create images of who I am and who I want to be. So we have this caribou over here, and again, it's all the wonderful uh, uh, women, indigenous knowledge keepers uh, from up north who have shared their knowledge systems, uh, like Leanne Charlie, who wrote that incredible article which allowed me to um, base some of my research on and bring it towards uh, my committee for evaluation because that article was written. And to me, I see uh, these indigenous women who came before me as knowledge keepers who are connected to the universe of our sacred indigenous knowledge. And then over here, I think of myself again as a city uh, caribou. I've got my boots on and I am out of the eyes with my parents and having a great time as I cruise the city. I also paint things. Uh, so this is a self-portrait of myself. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I talk about how I paint myself to remind myself of my responsibilities. So uh, I've got strawberries here. In my language, uh, the word strawberry translates to little heart. So I cradle myself and I cradle other people in the love of the land. 
I have a caribou antler which speaks to the complexity of the translation of knowledge between generations. So the caribou trails deviate slightly each generation. The old ones uh, uh, lead the young ones, uh, so they will survive, avoid pre predators. As such, we, as Dene people, we, uh, the older uh, Dene people, the more experienced people, uh, lead the way and teach us things, uh, but the knowledge changes slightly each generation so that we will survive. Footprints, because we Dene people, we never walk alone. We follow the footprints of our ancestors and we leave good footprints for our children and our grandchildren. And up above you see me holding a clipboard. My background is in bioethics, I'm an ethicist. Uh, most of my work is around informed consent. Uh, and so to me, uh, the clipboard represents the most sacred ceremony between clinician and between patient. And uh, I think that uh, as clinicians, uh, there needs to be um, an understanding that informed consent is not a transaction. It is a relationship, and these relationships take time. There are many uh, marvelous uh, clinicians, uh, allied clinicians, who are uh, good intentioned and want to heal these uh, broken relationships uh, between Indigenous people. But what I would like to say is that you cannot heal 500 years of colonialism in one visit, and these relationships uh, take time. But when that happens, when that sacred ceremony <coughs> happens uh, within the process of informed consent, it is a beautiful, uh, it is a beautiful ceremony where people come together. Uh, each person understands uh, what the goals are, what the wants are, what the needs are, what the desires are for each other, and uh, they create a, a, a wonderful wellness plan. Well, on the other side, we have a hawk feather. Uh, hawk fe the hawk feather was given to me by a community member. I sometimes have trouble speaking. I'm a nervous talker. <laughs> uh, I sometimes say the wrong thing. And so the feather helps me to speak with kindness, to speak with love, and to speak with clarity. So my work is a response to TRC Recommendation 24. Uh, I am creating an arts-based writing and painting an arts-based thesis. Now, I'm not creating it uh, just for its own sake. Uh, I plan to develop it into an image-based cultural safety module that can be used in all medical schools. And so why, why do I use image-based storytelling as a pedagogical practice? So uh, one of the things that's very important to me uh, when I'm navigating this colonial journey of uh, PhD studies is I want to situate my art in uh, the indigenous knowledge or indigenous continuum of passing knowledge through images. So we've used images for millennia to translate uh, uh, knowledge, so it's very important to me that I participate in the colonial academy in, uh, in a non-colonial way. I want to humanize bioscientific medicine. So often uh, we are given a clinical problem and uh, we have a lot of literature and a lot of charts and a lot of facts to back that up. But I find if I humanize that clinical problem, it sticks with people. Myself going through my undergrad, uh, uh, specializing in bioethics and clinical ethics, it was actually the stories, the narratives of the patients that stuck with me. And that's how I learned about ethics. That's how I learned about informed consent or withdrawal of care because I was reading the narratives of the patient. So I threw the theory away and uh, you know, hooked those uh, principles or knowledges around bioethics uh, through the patient narratives. Of course, illustrating Canada's colonial history, that is something uh, that is really difficult to do. It's difficult to have those conversations with other people. And so what I'm trying to do is make the intolerable tolerable. Um, and uh, illustrate the need for the knowledge of colonialism in the practice of medicine. People often don't realize that there are colonial forces, there are uh, racist forces in medicine. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to say about this is that uh, we in the academy were very arrogant. We think that we have access to our rational capacities 24-7. Well, none of us do. We all have colonial biases, we all have uh, racist biases, and all we can do is be aware of them and try to uh, change and improve our viewpoint, improve the way we are looking uh, at people. 
And the most important part of my um, image-based process is to illustrate resilience, is to show the world how beautiful we are as Indigenous people. So finding a way to talk about these things. So as I said, I like to humanize this clinical problem, and so I talk about uh, uh, myself and my family and my research. So I'm a 60s survivor from two generations of uh, residential, residential school survivors, and uh, many of us have complex uh, um, health issues or wellness differences, and I address that uh, by talking about our experience navigating uh, clinical and health systems. I also talk about our academic experience as well, which I will share a little bit about my own experience going through the uh, colonial classroom. And uh, I reflect on, upon colonialism and, and how it impacts our health outcomes. So in order to be a researcher and to be properly uh, reflective, I, I have to be aware of colonialism and how I respond to colonialism and how I'm interacting with colonialism in my day-to-day -day life as a graduate student. So I uh, pull from the knowledge systems of people that were here before me. I'm grateful that they're here uh, before me. This is Stolo Elder uh, Lee Miracle. And she wrote an article about how we as Indigenous people are forced to uh, uh, learn other languages and learn our feeling for the human condition. So I can... Uh, speak to this hierarchy in academic and indigenous knowledge because I am currently doing a PhD and I find myself nowhere in the study of rehabilitation science. And in fact, indigenous knowledge systems are not uh, accounted for or considered during my course of study. So it is ironic, uh, like uh, Lou Merkel is saying in this quote here, uh, that I have to go to uh, the Faculty of Medicine, I have to take this coursework, and I have to learn about colonial health systems in order to argue for indigeneity in the healthcare system. I'm grateful to Nama Rock and Mason. She helped me through a very difficult time when I was at a residency in Banff. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to return back to my program at the Faculty of Medicine because I could not... Uh, participate in a colonial way and what was very harmful for me. And so I was asking her, how do I argue for this? How do I argue for arts-based uh, methodologies, uh, arts-based indigenous methodologies in uh, a science-based uh, faculty? And so she said to me, uh, you must not dishonor the teachings of your ancestors by utilizing the research methodologies of our oppressors. And so because she gave me this piece of knowledge, uh, she she gave me the footing to stand on, to stand before my committee, to stand before my faculty, and explain how harmful it would be for me to do um, uh, uh, a, uh, sorry. <laughs> she gave me the footing to ex explain and to defend uh, the importance of me, of why an Indigenous person would have to uh, do a PhD with an indigenous research methodology, like an arts-based methodology. It was very, it was very empowering. Margaret Kovash talks about the complexity of, of reconciliation in the colonial academy. So we as indigenous people, we are invited into the colonial academy um, as a gesture of reconciliation, but still we are required to respond uh, to colonialism with a colonial response. And uh, Senator Murray Sinclair like, talks about how uh, education was used as a tool of oppression, a tool of Christianization, a tool of violence, a tool of uh, cultural separation, but yet we are in this conundrum where we have to use education as the key to reconciliation. So there are recurring objects in my images, uh, which I will share with you in the following slides. So they have cultural value, um, they're land-based, and they're relatable to bioscientific medicine. Uh, so the caribou, as I, I told you earlier, the story of the caribou. Uh, the antlers find their way to my image and they center me, they center my knowledge systems. Uh, they remind me of why I am uh, struggling through this PhD, but also affirm uh, my journey. 
this image here is a pink character I created when I was preparing to present my research to my cohort, which was very stressful for me. And so I thought about how caribou stands really strong and, um, and uh, waits for other caribou to come sometimes when she is separated. And I thought about that, uh, about how I am a caribou and I'm alone. But one day I will uh, be able to witness uh, in the hallway of U of T the, the thunder of the caribou hoops. It was a really beautiful experience. And so I couldn't even put together my slides or put together the words for presenting my research. And so I spent the uh, week reading this caribou here. Uh, strawberries, as I said, uh, the little hearts, all, always cradling myself in the love of the land, and footprints as well. My father, even though we were separated for most of our lives, uh, the few years that I knew him were filled with teachings. We had a lot of um, uh, teachings sometimes uh, in, um, in person, but a lot of times on the phone. So he would have breakfast and he would talk to me and we would be on the phone for hours. And he would give me all kinds of teaching, medicine teachings, caribou teachings, uh, lessons from his stories, uh, uh, critiques of uh, the biomedical model from where I was studying and asking me to consider uh, what these views were and how they were sometimes compatible <coughs> and incompatible with any knowledge systems. And then flowers. There's a wide range of, of flowers or a wide range of uh, uh, meanings of my flowers in my images. So uh, sometimes they are original instructions. They are the things that Creator sent us with. Sometimes they're medicine. Uh, that are surrounding us uh, when we need it. Uh, we also uh, also use flowers to hold me up, to keep me safe, uh, to remind me that I am indigenous. And then again with the clipboard. And so here's an example. We have the flowers there around the clipboard, and that is representing the ceremony of informed consent and the relationship that must take place. And then the hawk feather, which uh, I always need to help me speak clearly and with love. So images allow me to tell a more robust story. So this image is called Sharing Bioethics. And we have the two circles of medicine. And on the clinical side, the circle of medicine, we all recognize these tools. On the Denny side of medicine, I um, are created from stories from uh, my father. And so we have plants there that are used for different ailments. And uh, we also have the raven. Raven is a trickster and uh, teaches us to look at our, ourselves and look at situations and in uh, uh, difficult times uh, where we have to make decisions. And he does it in a playful and a fun way. Uh, the drum, which represents the heartbeat, how our heart beats with Mother Earth, but the heartbeat is also part of uh, our citizenry. We, our heart beats together when the drum calls us together. And so we also have the circle in the middle. We have the, the Denny woman and we have the clinician. And they're creating a new circle, a new circle of medicine. I have the flowers there, which represent uh, the medicine teachings, and then the strawberries, creating us in the love of So this is a little bit about my own journey, my medicine journey, or my journey of learning in the academy. I'm not a classically trained artist, and I learned to uh, paint out of necessity. I could no longer uh, perform. I could no longer write papers anymore. Uh, so uh, you know, this is a change of me crying over my laptop, and uh, the words would not come. I was given an assignment where I had to write about the impact of residential school. Uh, on Indigenous people and uh, also had to write about intergenerational trauma and the words would not come. Uh, I continued to go to my professor in her office hours and uh, explain to her how difficult this process was, that I was unpacking my history while I was doing this. And uh, it got to the point where I had to hand something in. Uh, so she was like, Lisa, you're going to have to give me something or I'm going to have to fail you. And so I said, can I hand in an, art, an arts-based exercise? And I did. 
And uh, when I made a, a painting or created a painting, I was able to uh, bring the words to the assignment so I could explain this is intergenerational trauma, this is what residential school looks like, this is what the 60s school looks like, and I could articulate it in a way because the images allowed me to do that. These images are ceremonial, they come to me um, through dreams, uh, through working with, um, with elders and through talking uh, with my family. So I'm grateful to have them. They don't belong to me. Uh, many of the flowers uh, I translate from image to image because these are knowledge systems that are intergenerational. And so I transplant the flowers from my grandmother to my father to myself and my daughter. And uh, this is an image of the most difficult time in my uh, thesis process. So uh, moving through the coursework, the coursework was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do through uh, my graduate studies. And it got to the point where I could no longer dream, I could no longer uh, draw, and it was a very <coughs> joyless time. Uh, so I went to my committee and told them about this. I, I said, I have this intellectual clutter of uh, bioscientific theory, of uh, rehabilitation theory, and I feel like I'm no longer myself. And so I have the full scap images there uh, representing uh, the intellectual clutter that was uh, keeping me, um, like the barrier was keeping me from being myself. And then I have the flowers surrounding me, which is uh, the indigenous medicine and the knowledge systems. And my committee very generously said, well, go ahead and throw out that stuff, throw out these, uh, these knowledge systems, and go to Bath and just, just be yourself. And I did that, and uh, the medicine did return. Next slide. So when I was there, I was able to reflect upon residential, or, or reflect upon my uh, family's history of residential school, uh, my history as a 60s group survivor, and uh, think about how I was going to reclaim my identity in the academy as a graduate student. And so I interacted with a few incredible women. Uh, this woman here is, uh, uh, she is a um, art historian and um, a department head of a prestigious uh, in Indigenous Studies uh, uh, program at Ivy League University. And interacting with her was so positive because uh, I didn't have to change my knowledge system. And she encouraged me to stay in graduate studies, and the painting is called Holden Thunderbird. And she's holding me in the sky, and she's saying, Lisa, uh, there are very powerful indigenous knowledge systems, and here's my indigenous knowledge system, which she's being held up uh, in the form of flowers. And uh, I went back to my program at the Faculty of Medicine, and I uh, continued to, to thrive. It was a different experience. And so I managed to find resilience uh, in the most tragic places. Uh, so uh, last year my brother died in not a great way, and uh, I was uh, put in the position where I, well not put in the position, I was asked by my mother to go to uh, England to retrieve my brother's remains, uh, to, uh, to bring him back home to her. And I was grateful to do that. I was grateful for the privilege to uh, bring him home because it helped me uh, uh, bond with my Dene teachings, but it also uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, be resilient. So here I am on the airplane. Uh, it was a very stressful flight. I wasn't feeling well. And I had to grapple with the idea that once the plane landed uh, in the UK, that my life would no longer be the same, that my family would no longer be the same, because it was a reality that my brother had passed away. Uh, this is me in the uh, funeral home, and I'm picking him up. Uh, you can see that little box there represents his, uh, uh, the box of his ashes. And when I first got there, it was a peculiar feeling. You know, you feel all the spirits wandering around, and um, it was strange to hold a box that was once a man, right? When you think about that, a little box that was once a man. So I thought about my brother, and I thought about all of our memories, and 
I thought about my mom holding him and nursing him and and here he was he was he was a box it was very uh, distressing and then I felt his spirit behind me and, and everything seemed to kind of fade away the anxiety was gone for a moment I had to return to next slide, uh, to his place his apartment to sort things out I went to meet his landlord uh, which was challenging his landlord had told me things about my brother's life that I didn't want to hear, that I wasn't prepared to hear, and that I didn't know. So my brother was very sad. He was very sick for a long time. My um, sister-in-law, his wife, had left him, and he was so full of despair that he would become confused and uh, forget where he was. Uh, it was, it was very distressing for me to hear. Um, I went into the apartment. Uh, he had, I really felt his spirit in the apartment. Uh, it, was a, it was a sad time. And I went through all his documents, which was very hard. And I went through this process of, um, you know, emotion that was very intense. Uh, you can go to the next slide. First, I was very, very sad. And then I was angry. I was angry. Uh, at him for not telling me how sick he was and then I was angry at myself for not asking for not making time and so I was going through all of these documents and my brother was a very very uh, meticulous uh, uh, keeper of things and uh, files and files of these uh, these organized documents and so he was as I said, he wasn't doing well, and he was navigating the healthcare system, uh, and, which was failing him tremendously. He was a person with a disability. He had uh, a severe head injury, so there was issues with depression, with pain, with confusion. And of course, I was reading through these documents that he had because he had to present them to the social worker. And so, seeing how sick that he was, and then seeing him have to fight with social workers to maintain his funding to prove that he was incapable of working was very, very distressing for me. But the most heartbreaking document uh, <coughs> was a personal letter that he had written to the clinic because they had informed him that he missed his appointment. And it said, Dear Doctor, I'm very sorry I missed my appointment. Sometimes I forget things. I live alone and there is no one to remind me of my appointments or to help me with scheduling. Devastating. Then I started going through a different box of documents and a different box of personal items and I saw his pictures and my heart started to lift, my heart started to sing because I could see all the places that he traveled and that he was very, very much alive. He was married a few times and uh, there were different passports and uh, invitations to fancy parties. He had many jobs. He was a teacher by training. He also worked for the UN as a speech editor and went to a lot of really amazing places. Seeing all the pictures of him, um, you know, with the women that he had dated or that he had relationships with reminded me that he was loved, that he was uh, allowed or given these uh, beautiful intimacies and also with pictures of him in different pubs around the world laughing with people and it reminded me that that he was he was very much alive and that he that he enjoyed himself so that was extremely comforting to me it's like well then it was time to go to bed so I went to bed and I put, I put him uh, close by me, and I had these dreams that were so intense. And I went to many places in the dreams. I went to places in our childhood, and then I went to places where I had, had not been. But it was such a, um, a disruptive dream that I was like, I can't have these every night that I'm here. I'll never make it home. And I knew that my brother would not hurt me, but I also knew that he was very restless. I don't think he liked me being in his uh, space. He was a tremendously private man. I don't think he liked that I knew that uh, he was sick. I think if he wanted us to know, his family to know that he was sick, he probably would have told my mom. He was very close to my mom. And so it was, it was a very, very disruptive dream. So I thought to myself, next slide, 
how can I make him sleep? And then I remembered cedar. Cedar helps us sleep. So I went on a walk looking for cedar. Uh, and I walked along this uh, lovely river path through the forest looking for cedar. I couldn't find any. Finally, I found it in a nice lady's uh, <laughs> uh, garden. And I talked to the tree, and I was telling the cedar why I needed her, and it felt like she moved towards me. And I was like, I love you, cedar. And she was like, I, you know, I'm always here, and so I'm singing to the cedar and putting tobacco down, and then there's this woman standing behind me. She was very kind. She had a sense of humor, and I told her what, what I needed the cedar for. Uh, so, uh, you know, she just kind of let me go on her way. I came home. I wrapped my brother in the cedar, and he started to rest. And I wanted to celebrate his life, and I wanted to know a little bit more about him. So I walked around his neighborhood and I uh, went to all the things that he talked about with my mom and things that he had written about in uh, letters that I'd received. And I touched every doorknob that he had been to. There was a bookstore and a thrift store and, uh, and a deli. I finally went to a deli where he would eat and I asked the lady that worked there, what would my brother what was my brother's favorite thing to eat? And he's, she was like, a clubhouse with one sausage on the side. And so I said, I'll have the same. And it was fantastic because while I was eating the sandwich, she was telling me about what my brother was like and the shenanigans that he would get into. And uh, it was a fantastic <coughs> experience. When I got home, I could feel that my brother was lonely. He was with me the entire time, and this was the first time I left him at home. And uh, so I thought to myself, you know what, why don't I do something that I would do with him uh, if I came to visit him? Let's do stuff like a brother and sister would do. So I threw him in my backpack and we went for a walk. And so uh, we went to a museum and uh, then I saw a carousel and I took him on uh, the carousel with me. Uh, the people who ran the carousel were very generous. You can slide. Uh, you know, they thought it was a bit peculiar. I'm riding around the carousel with my brother, me. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a, a tremendous experience because I could hear my brother's spirit laughing, laughing because he was enjoying the time with me, but also you know laughing at my my silliness, at my sentimentality. Uh, I got home and I wanted to pack things. I wanted to bring things home for my mom so she could, uh, uh, you know, have a piece of him, have a piece of his life. And I wanted to pick the right things. So I picked an egg cup uh, because I wanted, she used to make soft boiled eggs for us when we were little kids. And uh, so I, I thought that that would be a nice thing to share with her. I also brought a pillowcase because I wanted, uh, when it was time for her to rest, I thought that she could rest with my brother. And then the time came for me to leave and uh, the door blew open and I went through the door and, and I was on my way. When I got back onto uh, the plane, I was very sad, I was crying. I knew that my journey was coming to an end. And uh, when I left, the, it started raining, and I felt like England uh, was crying because my brother was leaving as well. And we cried together as we flew off. My brother comforted me as we were flying. I felt that he was flying over the plane with me. You can see all the flowers and the leaves representing the medicine and the comfort that he is, he is protecting me from this, this very, very emotional journey. Uh, it's interesting, you know, when you hold somebody, when you hold somebody's uh, remains, it is a very ceremonial experience. It is a sad experience, but it's also a bonding experience. It changes your body, it changes your spirit, but you become aware of how, how, um, what an honor it is to witness somebody's transformation, but also what a privilege it is to be alive. And so when I got home, I brought uh, my brother to my mother. And you can see that we are surrounded by flowers. We are surrounded by the medicine of the ceremony. And there are leaves falling. 
and I think about nature, I think about the earth, I think about what trees teach us. So leaves must fall to make leaves for, for new generations, for new leaves to come. And it was a, a, a beautiful experience. My mom, who is uh, 87, uh, and her walker uh, reaching out to take my brother, but also to take me in her arms, and remembering, right, that we are always safe in our mother's arms. And for a long time, my brother is the eldest and I am the youngest, a uh, family of five. It was just the two of them together. And because my dad was away in the Navy when, she, when he was born, and now my dad has passed on to the spirit world, and now it's just the two of them in her home. It's wonderful. So we talked about my journey. We talked about the challenge of uh, my journey, of what it was like. Um, and uh, my mom and I, you know, with our hands touching, standing over the table, removed the cedar from him. The restlessness was completely gone. And he had fallen to sleep. And you can see in this image here, it's my brother sleeping on the medicine that is a lifetime. And he is now uh, resting in the spirit world. So, Massey Cho, for uh, listening to me. Uh, I'm grateful for your time. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Miles, um, in the um, thank you so much. Sure, I was talking about your art. Um, did you, like, especially the flowers, did you paint them on the other Well, I, I, use a, I use a digital program, so it's digital painting. Yes. Oh, what is it called? Sorry. Oh, it's it's called Paint Plus. It's a, it's an eleven dollar program on, wow. uh, on <laughs> iTunes. Uh, uh, my daughter is an art student, so it's quite amusing. I, I did buy the fancier software and had a hard time learning it. So, uh, but the majority of my images are created in Paint Plus, and then I use things like uh, uh, Illustrator to uh, render them and make them larger. Yeah, I know. I love this color. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your art and sharing your stories. Um, I had some questions when you talked about being a student and you know doing your research in your way. If you have any ideas um, for us in the academy on how we can support students in um, bringing in their own indigenous ways, you know, into the academy. Can you speak a little bit more to that idea? Well, I think there are ways to collaborate and learn from uh, Indigenous Studies programs as well as um, an, an abundance of, of literature. I think one of the barriers that I faced when I was talking about uh, Indigenous knowledge systems is that um, uh, in bioscience, sometimes uh, uh, interdisciplinary studies can be resisted, not all the time, but sometimes they can be. And so for me, doing my literature, I actually had to pull from art writers uh, and from, uh, you know, indigenous people like, uh, uh, you know, Lee Miracle. Uh, to actually lay the groundwork to do these things. But it's really hard to do them within the academy when there's not uh, precedence. So it's, it's, it's finding a way. And it's also um, asking students uh, uh, for their knowledge or asking students how you can support them. Uh, my supervisor, uh, Stephanie Nixon, is a, um, is a settler but uh, has an abundance of Indigenous knowledge and has worked in Indigenous communities and has um, often asked for, for my, my guidance into uh, just what do you need from me? And sometimes we have to collaborate, right? And I think of our graduate study relationship, our, our PhD uh, supervisor, uh, relationship is a treaty, which is is a promise to each other, or like the informed consent process, it's a it's a promise, it's a relationship where we are developing it, but it's a time consuming process that is a uh, scholarly, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, that takes a lot of time to build. Thank you. Thank you.
I actually have a question. Um, you spoke a little bit earlier about the process and bringing your art based storytelling into your graphic study as a way to kind of reflect on the um, engaging material. Um, but I've noticed that we got to know each other yesterday as well that, um, that so much of your art and so much of your work is so personal and so rooted in who you are. I just wanted to know kind of what that was emotionally like for you to then have to kind of present that. You know, because I, I think of myself when I, I tend to distance myself academically from, from what I present. You know, like the work that I do is not who I am. But I, I would see that it might be difficult to separate those two entities. So I just wanted to know like how, how that process is, what that's like for you. Well, we are, um, you know, as a research scientist, uh, you know, or as academics, we're often called to separate ourselves from uh, research. And I guess one of the things that I struggled with was the amount of literature and the amount of knowledge that I was responsible for, uh, responsible to learn these building blocks, but there was no reflection of the needs of myself or my community or my family. Um, some of the literature that we do have, I mean, there's, there's, there's good uh, bioscientific literature um, that, uh, is ed that is educational uh, about indigenous health, but there's also bad literature as well, right? So um, for me, it's exhausting to read literature that is overflowing with the statistical demise and uh, medical stereotypes of indigenous people. It just strips your humanity away. So, I guess for me, I mean, I, I, there there are there are two answers. One, um, which I spoke of earlier, is about humanizing the clinical problem. About actually saying, like, this is my family. This is how it felt. This is my experience, and um, this is why it's important. Um, the image-based component was uh, purely out of the necessity of time, right? We read thousands of articles. How many of those articles do we remember, right? If you're a clinician, you're responsible for reading thousands of articles as well. So an image is something that you can actually hook a concept on and it stays with you and it's, it's constantly developing and you can revisit that. So I wanted to have something that had staying power. Um, but, you know, it is really difficult and it's really tiring. Um, as you know, um, uh, right now I'm doing a, a, a teaching tour, and so I'm doing 11 talks in 15 days in five different cities. And I am leaving a piece of myself every time I share my story with you. But it is an extension of my goodwill, and the intention of that is I want Indigenous people to feel safe when they go to the doctor. And so leaving this piece of myself is, um, I guess it's, a, it's, it's part of the labor process. And I'm grateful to do that. And I guess I, that's my pushback against uh, bioscientific literature, right? Is humanizing this clinical problem, giving it a, a dynamic, uh, uh, a tool like uh, an image to, to hook a concept on and to bond with the reader or the, the viewer. Thank you so much for um, such beautiful work and very moving presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question about art-based practice and pedagogy um, and teaching and how um, I'm thinking about practitioners and teachers who are um, curious about integrating this in some way in the courses um, and maybe don't have as much experience. Um, I don't know if you have any tips or advice about creating um, an approach that's welcoming to students to bring art-based practices and how instructors may bring the value of those assignments. Um, because I think we often, you know, it's, it's pretty simple to say, like, write an essay, write a paper on this, do this research, and then write this essay. But I think it's a bit more intimidating to say, um, re, you know, include art based, um, I'm literary here, so it's pretty simple to me, but it's like include art based um, resources as research and then also include potentially art based practices in 
Yes, yes. Well, there are um, there are growing resources around arts based practice in um, medicine, so the medical arts humanities. So there's there's a lot of great things out there. Some of the people that um, I have worked with and I pull from are uh, Allison, uh, Dr. Allison Crawford and Dr. Uh, Lisa Richardson from U of T Faculty of Medicine. Uh, they also co-teach a class at the AGO, which is the Art Gallery of Ontario, uh, for medical students. So they talk about arts-based theory, but they all, there's also uh, an exercise component to that. Um, I guess. The, um, what I've learned from them and what I learned through my own art space practice of doing art space workshops is that um, there's a camaraderie that comes with creating art when you're sitting with somebody, but there's also um, a reflexivity that doesn't uh, take place or, um, or I shouldn't say that, uh, there is a reflexivity uh, that is unusual or unfamiliar sometimes. So when you're asked to quantify yourself or describe yourself as a uh, a professional or as a clinician or why you do research or why you know you practice medicine you know the first thing we do is we write it down you know when we're writing a cover letter or a, a CV uh, and then uh, but myself like I prefer to draw you know when I was drawing you know me with the strawberries and stuff like that so if you ask somebody to draw their own visual narrative of themselves it encourages this 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 marvelous reflexivity in a safe space where people are creating uh, uh, but there are many uh, resources. There's also a graphic novel, novel artist, uh, Louise Kinos, who is at Paul and Bloorview uh, in Toronto. She's a fantastic. And also, these women are amazing. Like, you could just literally cold call them, email them, Twitter them, and they'll just send you a, you know, a reading list. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you for great question. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the Music Learning Circle and the Center for Arts and Indigenous Health, we really appreciate your time. Your work is, is um, indescribable. I thank you very much for coming and listening to me and sharing your time. Thank you.